Hello, Ray Lee with Speedboat Magazine. We are here with another episode of Boats and Bros with your host, host Myrick Coyle. Myrick, how's it going? It's going all right, Ray. How about yourself? I'm good. Uh, today we have the Johnny Tomlinson alum on board with us. How's it going, John? It's going real good today. Very nice. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. Yeah, so uh, JT, the uh, one of the best throttlemen ever, and uh, I'm glad to have him on the podcast because uh, he's like my idol slash mentor slash all that stuff. I mean, going from being a crew member to uh, riding the boat with him to actually racing against him at times now. So pretty cool, full circle kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, first time that I met Johnny was uh, we, I brought a boat down to his shop on 188th Street, which was Thunderboat Row back in the day. And uh, uh, it was a madhouse and went in there and, and met him and like, oh, my gosh, it's Johnny Tomlinson, you know. And uh, and then from there on, I was like just trying to prove your worth around the race team and things like that. And it's a pretty cool deal. So, John, when was your first race? 1986 with uh, Lauren Leibel's boat, a 38 cigarette called Molson Indy that uh, Lauren brought to me and Mike, our second, third year business, second year business to do a re-rig on it. Staggered engine, the old wet sump, fuel injected, 500 inch big blocks that made 725 horse if you're lucky. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was the boat Bob Latham throttled it. And uh, I knew I just had to get in this boat some way, somehow. So. After me and Mike rigged it, um, I talked them into letting me be the rider, navigator, slash mechanic. So yeah, you actually, didn't you actually take your tool bag with you back then? Yeah, because yeah, we raced about 150, 160 miles. So yeah. it was it was needed then, and uh, it got me on board that boat. So 1986 was the first year. First year around it, when I worked at Rehealing Grady Racing Engines out of high school, I was probably at the races, you know, going down to Key West probably since like 82 82, 83, something like that. A while to think you back then you're going there watching it all. And then one day you'd be the one that everybody's like, Oh, there's Johnny. He's won it here so many times kind of thing. I used to go down there when I was a kid thinking I got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> cool. Whatever I got to do to do this. Is what I'm yeah. No do. kidding. Johnny, how did you first get around boats? Did your parents have some growing up? Yeah, I was, uh, I got three older brothers and, Born and raised down here in Miami. My dad's out of Chicago. My two oldest brothers were out of Chicago. And me and my other brother, Bobby, were born down here. But the four of us being down here, uh, growing up on or around the water, my dad liked the boat. So we'd have a little John boat, a little skiff. My oldest brother used to work on outboard boats, you know, ever since he was in high school. So I used to, he was about 10 years older than me. So I used to always just chase him around trying to wrench, taking stuff apart, whatever I could do for him. And that's how I got around it and just kind of fell in love with it and figured this is what I want to do. One yeah. Later. And, uh, and you and Mike Thomas, like uh, tech school buddies. Yeah. Is yeah. We right? had, actually, we graduated North Miami senior high school in 1980 and they actually had back then they had auto shop, wood shop, fabrication shop, machine shop, and they had marine mechanics. And marine mechanics was really hard to get into. And the teacher at the time was an ex-boat racer, ex-tunnel boat racer. And he was an old school guy, Bill Mark. He was a great guy. We learned a lot from him. And I remember that I couldn't get in. You could get in to marine mechanics in your 11th and 12th grade year as an elective. And it was a three-hour class. And I couldn't get in. And Mike had gotten in. Unfortunately, my older brother was in so much trouble in school all the time. And my parents got to know the principal very well. <laughs> and they were able to get me in that class because the class was full, booked up. So I got in for, you know, my 11th and 12th grade year. And uh, that's where I got to know Mike. And Mike was my partner in class and uh, took off from there. We learned outboard mechanics and a little bit of stern drive stuff. And it was pretty cool. Yeah, and for yeah, people that, that don't know, TNT, uh, Tomlinson and Thomas. So TNT is, is their last name, yep. It's a pretty cool name. Yeah, I remember working at Rehealing Grady Racing Engines, and I'd be in the parts washer, you know, washing pistons after we hand massaged them. We're just washing stuff, getting ready to assembly, and I used to tell the guys, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a shop, and me and Mike are going to call it TNT. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But we did. Yeah. yeah. Still going, started- however many years later, too. 
since 80, 84. We started in January of 84. And before then, we were just working on boats. You know, I worked at Rehilly and Grady building or learn how to build stock car engines and engines for the race boats. They built a lot of race boat engines for Longshot, for Rampage, Eddie Trotta, Billy Ellswick. Some modified boats for uh, Danny Weinstein, who owned Power Play at the time, and built all those engines. So I was involved in it and got to learn all those engines and uh, build them and assemble them and work on the boats. So that's kind of how I uh, kind of grinded my teeth there. So then they were moving to the Carolinas with their stock car program, and I didn't want to move. And we were already doing a lot of work at night after work for different customers. One of the guys there, Tommy Allen, ran the parts department. He had left and started Champion Cylinder Heads up by Keith Eichert's place. So next thing you know, I was getting phone calls from them to service some boats that had their engines in it. So it was kind of escalated and took off that way. And then when I knew I didn't want to move to North Carolina is when I told Mike, you know, we ought to. 21 years old, let's go open a shop out to Opelika, get a warehouse and try and make a go at this. And uh, we'll start work like five in the morning. We'll knock off at like two every day and we'll go spear fishing every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like three times. That yeah. about the same reason that I moved to Lake of the Ozark to go bass fishing and I never get to go anymore. <laughs> Johnny, what year did you guys start uh, TNT? 1984. Very nice. 1984. Yep. We started out in Opelika and, uh, Warehouse is still there where we're at and uh, started in 84 and uh, started getting referrals for different work. Like I say, from the engine shop I worked at from their customers, a couple of Keith Eichert's customers since one guy, Tommy, worked up there. And then uh, we started doing a lot of work for being good at Midnight Express, the original Midnight Express. He was, they were building boats so fast. They were multi-engine boats. So we were always doing service for them, engine changes for them, warranty work for them. So kept us busy and just kept us rolling. That's cool. Got us going. Yeah. Yeah. And you did everything. I mean, I remember you saying, telling me about uh, going other places and putting out boards on boats and things like that. I mean, run of the Bahamas and all those boats and change outboard engines on the beach and need deep water and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, change them in Nassau, you know, tied up to the dock with a, with a, you know, tow truck hanging an engine or haul them out over there. So whatever yeah. way you could get it done thing. Yeah, that's what you did, right? <laughs> yeah. Compared to today. If I, I mean, if, if the forklift isn't right there, easy to use, we're like, oh, we ain't doing this. <laughs> you know? Get in the shop. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We get, that's it. But, yeah. You know, do it in the water, put an engine on. <laughs> right. Hire someone else to go do it. So I would go do it. Yeah. So Johnny, cool. tell me about that, that, that first uh, uh, experience that you got into the boat where you got to be the, into the race boat where you got to be navigator. What were your feelings? And, and is that when you got bitten by the race bug? Well, I was bit before that, just yeah. you know, growing up as a kid and seeing all the old boats. And, you know, I used to get Powerboat magazine since I was like in seventh grade. You know, I probably still got some of them in a box somewhere. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I was, you know, I was a bit as a young kid and, uh, wanted to get involved in it. And then when I got the opportunity to get in the boat, then that just, you know, fueled the fire even more. Yeah. Yeah. And from, so you went in that class, but then you got into uh, what you consider a stock class, right? Yeah. Uh, what we did is uh, we ran 1986 in that boat, Molson Indy. And actually we were the only V bottom running open class. Everybody had transitioned into the cats and the boat wasn't ready. So the first race of the year in the boat, was in Treasure Key in the Bahamas in 1986, and we couldn't go because the boat wasn't ready. So our first race was in Marathon. And Ryan Beckley reminded me of that years ago. <laughs> he said, you know, 30 years ago today, you were in Marathon. That was your first race. <laughs> and uh, <Yeah. laughs> Ryan's a great historian when it comes to all that. And uh, so uh, I ran that boat or run Navigator in it, and then was able to do all the testing. So I was able to throttle and drive testing it with Bob Latham and stuff in between races and, you know, kind of cut my teeth and really learned a lot just watching him throttle the boat. We had a lot of ocean, all ocean races back then. So uh, after that, I ended up selling that boat uh, to a guy named Mandy Fernandez. And he ultimately ended up racing the Ferrari Jaguar in class one over in Europe. And, but I sold it to him and we actually ran it um, as Hawk Marine special in 1987. And, and only the local, which was the OPBRA local club of APBA back then, that was all through Florida. They had a series of races in Florida. So I ended up driving it for him in 1987. And then after that, 
Uh, he had put some people, another guy in the boat, he had got a catamaran, so I bounced back and forth with that. And then got the opportunity to run a pro stock boat for a friend of his, which was a triple outboard called Thoroughbred Motor Cars. Ran that a few races. We did the OPT races out in California and here in Florida. So kind of just, you know, move, just keep trying to move up the ladder, move up the ladder. At the time, we were getting more and more race boats to work on. So there was a good, I would say, run from, you know, a 10-year run from the early 90s to 2000 where, before we moved into Bobby Moore's and bought him out, all we did was work on race boats. It'd be me, Mike, and a couple of guys, and we'd have, it wasn't uncommon to have seven, eight, nine different race boats in the shop, in the warehouse, and we'd work on them all and get them all ready for the races until uh, we started doing more everyday stuff as years went on. But uh, so, yeah, so just kind of worked my way up the ladder, get an opportunity to run. I ran with Philly and his 41 Apache Dollar Marine Special for off and on for a couple of years. Uh, got the opportunity to, you know, basically jump in different boats along the way. Even did a two-year stint running a tunnel boat on my own until it just started costing me too much money and I had to get back to what made me a living. So just <laughs> yeah. worked my way up the ladder. And uh, then for Anthony Izzo, we started doing some open-class boats and him and Rick Conti would run and I'd get them all tested, get them prepared. And then in the early 90s, Lauren called me back and ran the Labatt's Genuine Draft boat with him for a year and then another boat for another guy. And, you know, I was really bouncing around thinking, you know, I'm just not getting the ride. I think I won and I really should be getting one of these good open class rides. But now when I look back then, I wasn't ready for it. You know, I wasn't ready for it. I thought I was ready, but I wasn't ready for it. And I guess my big opportunity came when we built a 42 Couve open class boat for Anthony Izzo called Heavy Metal. I ran that. Um, ran a 40 skater, one of Stuart Haynes old 40 skaters for a guy in Puerto Rico called uh, CSB, ran that, ran in Key West. That's when the gentry accident happened. And then in 95, ran with Lauren again on the Bass Genuine Draft. And then Leif Farone came on board with the Zero Defect Boat in 1996. And that was my first full-time open class ride. And we ended up winning every single race that season. And then followed up with a repeat championship run in, in Europe in the Charlie Motors boat that he secured a ride in and brought me over for that the following year in 97. That's cool stuff. And that's that's what I'm of, thinking about it. And, you know, it took off. And then that 97 year, I ran class one, uh, Charlie Motors. Late then I won the championship, won the European championship and the Middle Eastern championship and got the class one championship then. And then I also, that same year in 97, was running with Pat Patel and 36 skater and modified class with Sterling Power. And we won that championship also here so that was 97 was a pretty busy year with a lot of races and really no conflicts so it was yeah. gone almost every weekend but yeah and then just you know my name got out there and i think the biggest thing is like i always told myra all along when you when you can work on the boats and facilitate the boats and then i'll get the opportunity to get in the boats i just think you're much better because you understand the boats you understand more what they need you understand more of what things can go wrong and I think it was a huge advantage. And because we could have a shop with the boat, because we could work on them and we were successful working on them, then it was giving me opportunities to get in the boats and run them also. Yeah, that's what I've told a lot of people. I was like, you're standing there on the dock with your tool bag and, the, the you know, they're like, well, get in. <laughs> you're like, oh, okay. And then you go for enough rides, you start to get comfortable and you start to understand things and, and it makes a big sure. difference. I mean, I used to ride, there was races uh, before I, I was just a crew member that I, I actually rode in the back of the boat with Johnny and Dave. Uh, there was one where uh, it was Fort Lauderdale and I was in the back of the Bacardi Silver 46 skater. We'd get in trouble if anybody ever found out about that now. But they're like, <laughs> we were taking the boat out of Johnny's place and we're sitting in the back of the, the boat and uh Johnny's like, Hey, you guys want to go? I mean, you know, it's your weight isn't going to matter. It's kind of rough out there and it don't matter. And we're like, yeah, heck yeah, let's go. And thousand horsepower. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It didn't matter. And, uh, so we go out there and do this and there's so many, and then we did the same thing in, in, uh, New York on, on the, uh, at the Roderick and, and I got in there. Florida race is when, uh, well, we won't say his name, but John was on other John was on the boat and we had a really long billing. Oh, yeah. It, yeah, it, it was, was the Fort Lauderdale Air and Sea Show, and they had all this action going on. <laughs> it was super rough. 
and we're milling and milling. And I look back and Myrick, you know, he's not directly we didn't have by intercoms there. So I could see him, but we didn't have intercom or maybe we did. I don't know. And I look over and he's going, seasick. <laughs> Yeah. Up on himself. Yeah. <laughs> John, John's throwing up and right beside me. And he's and Johnny and jo Johnny and Dave could talk to each other, but we couldn't from the back seat forward. And uh, yeah. so he looks back and I'm like trying not to throw up too because Price has got his arm out with the puke on it, like now putting it at me. And then by then, Johnny gets a whiff of it from the back of the boat and is like, they're puking back there. Oh. <laughs> well, we even had it said it said Maverick and Goose on our helmets because <laughs> we had a piece of tape on the front that said Maverick and Goose on it. And uh that was funny. And then uh that was a I think that was the first race we raced against uh uh Centron. Yeah, Citron was right was there because Yeah, exactly. Yep. D F uh, Young, I think, at the time, yeah. I don't know if it was DF Young or Citron. Or Citron yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so yeah, that was. That had to be 04, 04, 04, 04 yeah. I'd say. Yeah. That 40 skater. Uh, the 46. And uh, yeah, 46. And then, you know, I was thinking, all right, get these guys out of the boat, at least get some air. Well, then all of a sudden, here comes a smoke for the mill yeah. area. The three minute smoke. So I said, guys, we're going. <laughs> we're going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Price was so embarrassed. Price was so embarrassed. He was like trying to clean up the back of the boat as we're going in after the race. We won the race. I mean, it actually got pretty close there at the end. And, uh, and it, it was like, I remember looking out the window and there's these big uh, aircraft carriers with all the crew of the aircraft carrier standing and around the edge of the boat, everything. It was really a neat deal. And, uh, yeah. So I actually got to be in a couple a racist in the back seat, which I bet you a lot of people can't say that. <laughs> hey, John, on during our first, during our first episode, Myrick had mentioned uh, how he grew uh, worked in his early years around you and looking up to you and just kind of trying to impress you. Do you remember him from back then? And him, the first him and Jackhammer. Cause I was trying to impress the crew chief because the crew chief is the one that's going to let me do more stuff. Johnny oversaw it all, but the crew chief was the one yeah. that told me what to do. Yeah. But I met Myrick way before that. I met yeah. Myrick when he was working at uh advanced Marine. Yeah. Yeah. And yep. Dave Scott had his 36 skater and Dave Scott brought his 36 skater to us. 98, 99, something yeah, 99, like that. Yeah. For us to pull the Mercury's out and install the Sterling's. And that's when Dave hired me to run the first shootout. It must have been 99, I think. So then I went to the lake to do some testing. And then Myrick was at Advanced Marine. And we went to go get the boat, go to the water. And that's when I first met Myrick. And that had to be, what, 99, Myrick? 99, 2000. I'd well, say 2000, yeah. What was your first impression of him? The way Myrick was a worker. He was a thrasher, you know, because then he yeah. hang around the boat whenever, you know, we were working on it and all that. And uh, Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, no family. And really, since I moved there, I didn't have many friends. So there wasn't anything to do but work at that point. I mean, that was my life. So that was, it was a great time to, to be doing that. And uh, yeah, then, then we kind of got, uh, Dave got a deal with Anheuser-Busch and then we started seeing each other more often because we were doing kilo runs and doing uh, boats. Yeah. Multiple boats and stuff like that. We were making boats every year. The next one was the 46 yeah. skater. And then, you were also uh, a Drambuie on Ice, Montana Hartman yeah. at the time. You were you were rolling pretty hard with yeah. them. Okay, so that was right after Forrest Barber. Forrest yeah, Barber right after Forrest, Forrest Barber. I remember meeting him, but I never remember going to the races yeah. with him. I, Hugh Fuller was in the boat when I started Hugh going. Ran true open class engines, fuel injected, you know, naturally aspirated engines, and uh, that was the first ninety. So ninety eight, ninety nine would have been Drambuie, and then yeah, we brought it over to. Montana Hartman with Hugh Fuller and Gary Montano, and then uh, had the wild dream of having a two boat team and putting Bacardi Silver on one of Dave Scott's boats, but that didn't. Yeah, it didn't work out so well. You know, two two guys that are used to running their own show, not really getting along. So at, uh, to go to your own thing, and we'd pit beside each other, but we weren't in the same, really in the same team at that point. And it's two different classes. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So, but that was when Dave, all his boats were just running extreme class and we were still hot and heavy as super cat. Super cat. Yeah. Yeah. So, so is super cat your favorite, is super cat your favorite class you've ever raced in or? Cause it's, you know, the class one boats I like too now yeah. and over in Europe and super cat. Yeah. 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 Cause they're just so competitive and, you know, I learned a long time ago, especially my first race in 97 in class one that, you know, there's no breathers. There's no breathers, you know, no. competitions fight. You're, you're on the wood, you're on the pegs the whole time, every second of the race. Cause if you're not, you, you got no shot of being out front. And that's the way Supercat was. It still is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you, if you get a seven to 10 second lead, it's a long ways in Supercat. Yeah. So. Yeah. so when the opportunity first came about uh, for Myra to get uh, beside you, just the two of you guys in the cockpit, uh, do you remember uh, how he did? Cause he spoke to that in our first episode. Want to see if your, your memories <laughs> jive the same. No, yeah. So, but yeah, he's trying to see if, if you remember my first uh, experience in the in in uh, Sarasota the way that I remember it, basically. Oof, probably <laughs> not the way you remember it. But hey, we, uh, no, so we oh, entered yeah, the, the, the Mystic. No, the no, no, the Mystics. We blew the hatch off it, but no. So the Mystic was the year after. But when we were in the Supercat, so Supercat, and we entered the unlimited class because we didn't meet all the SBI rules because we were racing OSS in the Supercat at the time. And Chris Hanley and Dave had gotten into it. And then, so Chris, Chris got the boot, and then I had the opportunity to get in as uh, the backup driver, as Price in would say. MTI. Yeah, in, in the, the MTI. MTI. Supercat. I don't yeah. remember what we had to run it as an extreme. I didn't remember. Yeah, that. we did. We had to run it extreme, and uh, there there was a big class there. I think it was oh five or oh six. I think I said so, last time oh five. Missy, first time I ever brought Missy to a race. But where was the forty six skater then? Uh, no, I, I don't think that uh, it was around. No, no, we ran the Trimax Drive MTI. No, no, no? you you guys did. No, because later in the year, 46 Skater was still at Key West. We went to uh, Key West with the two Bud Select boats, and they were both uh, campaigned together because okay. Dave Dave wanted you to focus on the Unlimited boat with him instead of being uh, in both boats with me and you. So then he brought Alvin Heathman to the Key West race. Yeah, yeah, that was after the fact, though. All right, so back to Sarasota. Yeah. S- same year, though, same year. Okay. Yeah, so I was telling. Well, obviously, you don't remember. Thanks a lot for that. Well, I will. No, <laughs> I, remember, I remember Orange Beach. Oh yeah, well, duh. We all never <laughs> forget that one. I got pictures on my wall of that one. Uh, no, but so anyway, we go. We go through the. We're going through testing. Young Myrick, Johnny can do it all at the time. Newell had done it all already. Like he said, ninety six, ninety seven. He's winning a lot of races. I'm in the boat thinking that we're like going 110% and testing. He goes, okay, you ready to go to the next level? <laughs> and I'm like, holy <laughs> crap, there's another <laughs> level to this. <laughs> yeah, there's I'm another. Now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then come to find out, I mean, that was when the course was still kind of big at Sarasota, not like not as big as it had been in the past. Yeah. We but uh, in the one go out and go in the other cove. and Yeah, exactly. Around, I think it's Siesta Key, you'd kind of go around it or something like that. But uh, it was like a hundred mile race, and I remember thinking how long we were out there, and we had we ended up almost lapping the whole field, and there was a lot of unlimiteds out there at the time, so it was pretty neat for me. I mean, I don't think it was like a it wasn't it wasn't like all the OSS guys were there because OSS was the the place to be at that time in those years. Yeah, but see, before the Supercat. We did the 44 MTI, Trimax Drives, Big Power. Which no, right after. Right after the Supercat we did that? Yeah, right after the Supercat because we had – it was right after because, remember, we put the Supercat tunnel in it, and then we had to put the big humps on the side. Right, I'm, right, pretty, right. I'm pretty sure that the Supercat – then the 40, then both 44s, the turbine 44, and then the other 44 came out at the same time. Cause by yeah. then, then Bob Bull was bought the 
the super cat and we were back to unlimited because we were in uh pickwick with the unlimited mti 44 mti and he was racing the 42 uh that's what super cat at the time what's that Pickwick when Chris Hanley did his interview. <laughs> oh yeah, it, that's that's what Johnny. What, that's what we said. I, I D- Dave was uh he was a stickler on things, but uh, D- Chris Hanley was doing an interview and we're, and that's actually that was his last race, I think. And uh, then he did an interview, and then I got his job. <laughs> <laughs> then the next race, so so they come to give an interview of the driver, and says Mark's driving the super. And he goes, hey, the last guy that interviewed got fired. I'm not interviewing anybody. Yeah, I'm out of here. No way. I'm the mechanic. Yeah, and, and Roderick. Rod, 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 and right at the time, Roderick was our PR guy, so he lined it all up. So yeah, it's Roderick's fault. I knew Roderick through Drambuie and got him in as the PR guy for him. There's a push for Dave Scott's team. Yeah, Can literally. He started in this, and now look at where he's at. Yeah, now he's Didn't in charge of all set on it. camera. Oh, it wasn't anything bad. It was just the fact that that uh, you know, it was it wasn't approved and all that and it just uh, it and all that. That's anyway. Not, that's not yeah. Funny. It was just coincidence. So Yeah, it was. It was. It was, but it was funny that that the fact that we laughed about it at the time, but then yeah, 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 it was. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't the reason why exactly. But it was just coincidence. Chris was ready to go home for a while anyway, I think. And yeah. he did. He was it's just burnt out. And I tell you what, we were racing so many boats and building so many boats at the time. You would get, we were getting burnt out. I mean, there yeah. would be times when we'd sleep on the back of the trailer, go to the shootout. Because <laughs> I knew I wouldn't go in to go to bed and make it back to, to get we the boat in the water the next morning. With two or three boats. And yeah, it was never any sleep. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so did you guys gel together pretty well as a team as far as chemistry goes in the cockpit? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I, to this day. I just I, listened to what he said. <laughs> yeah. Nah, to this day, that's why, you know, I got the opportunity to run the performance boat center. Jimmy John's boat with Myrick. I jumped on it, you know. Yeah. Jumped on it. You know, Myrick had called me about it, and I was running with Bob Bull at the time in, in the second CMS boat. And then, uh, so, you know, I really didn't get back to Myrick on it. <laughs> and uh, the following year, we were going to run CMS. And then Bob says, hey, John, if you get another ride, take it, you know. And uh, so I'm not, much, I'm not sure how much longer we're going to be doing this. So then Myrick called me and he says, hey, I hear you're not in the CMS boat. I said, well, Bob's, you know, really not doing much, running a limited season, told me if I get another ride, grab it. And Myrick said, well, why didn't you call me? I said, because I turned you down when you called me last year and I wasn't going to come begging back. Goes, call you back. So then yeah. Myra called me back and says, yeah, talk to Mark. You want to come run this thing? Come on board. And I said, I'm there. I'm there. So yeah. we run four years together. Yeah. yeah was, we, we went to that first race in Cocoa Beach, and that's the first time we had ran it that Saturday before the race. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait till you run this thing. And he's like, okay. And it ha- happened to be a calm day at Cocoa Beach, which never happens. And we go down the thing and I'm like, here, watch. I was like, just blip the throttle a little bit. And we yank the wheel and he goes, it'll do that every time. I go, it'll do it every time. And he's like, we're good. <laughs> so then we went out for the race and the race, race was rough. Yeah. Yeah. So it was rough. It was yeah. calm the day before it was rough. So we won the race and afterwards that was the, yeah, so that would have been the first race other than we were in one of Dave's boats. And we come back in and Myra goes, I had no idea you could run these things this hard in the rough. I said, well, you see, we had to or we wouldn't have been out front, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Four-year stretch. Yeah, we were and hard. Probably as a four-year run, probably most successful four-year run I've ever had, Myra. You know, yeah. me and you ran because we won championships every yeah, year. Yeah, we had – Three worlds yep. and I think had, three nationals. I got the big old thing up here. It says three time national champion, but it was three nationals and four worlds. Three, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I was that was one of my questions. I mean, you, do you have any idea how many races you've been in? In in in, in your whole in your whole career, do you have any idea? Two hundred, three hundred, and it's over two hundred. Yeah. Yeah. You figure you're going on. This is going to be year. What's this going to be? Eighty six to now, year thirty five. Yeah, and you're racing. You do a minimum of ten a year. 
of actual events because Key West was three. Yeah. How exactly. many times did we go to Key West and races with multiple boats? Oh, yeah, many times. So, you know, last year was six races, Key West, multiple boats. Yeah. Next year, so you've got to be what, 350 races, probably. Yeah. It's a lot. Think? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that, yeah, go ahead. No. Out of all those races, John, do you, do you have one that really stands out in your mind, whether it be uh, gnarly or just super emotional or any of those? An emotional one was when Myrick and I got by Billy Moth, won the championship in Key West. That was that, exactly the one that was in my mind, too. That's an emotional one. Uh, what, what made that so emotional at that time? Just because all year we were battling them, you know, and we were trading off races. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. that race... You know, towards the end, we were catching him, but Billy was, you know, he was defensive dry. He wasn't doing anything yeah. dirty. He was protecting yeah. the lead, but sometimes he'd get a little excessive and he'd run us and last Push corner, us into the rock, or not yeah. push us into the rocks, but yeah, pinch us off. Coming into Key West Harbor, we came in outside. Myrick ducked inside. He went outside to block us. We were already inside. By the time he came over, he couldn't block us because we were there. So <laughs> once we got by him and then came in and won the race the next lap, I got, I got, I remember got a little animated and it didn't have to be on TV. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah, it was. But, you know, I, it was a hard fought race. But uh, that one and, you know, quite, there, there's been a lot of them, but the ones that stand out, that one, a couple of them that I had in class one in Europe, especially in 97 when we won that championship. And, you know, with Hugh Fuller, we knocked off three in a row here, you know, three years in a row. So those were good ones. But as far as individual races, like, I remember a race in Beirut, Lebanon. It was just a hard fought race. We ended up finishing second or third. I think Steve Curtis won that one, but it, the race was a battle. It was hot. It was long. You know what I mean? And just, so I remember that one pretty significantly. Yeah. I, I remember, uh, yeah. Who was that one with? Uh, that was in the Jolly Motors boat in Beirut, Lebanon, that 97 season. We won one there and we won one in, <coughs> we won two in Norway. <laughs> and those were, you know, those were kind of spectacular wins for me also. And then uh, when you think back in the States, I mean, we knocked off plenty of wins with Dave Scott stuff within, without competition. And when we had competition, we were successful. And then, uh, but even last year, you know, went in, in Husky Boat and, you know. Yeah, with Taylor. With Taylor with competition was great. I mean, they're all good. You know, they're all good. But there's, there's ones that stand out a lot. Remember, we went to that race in Puerto Rico against CRC. We ended up. You know, Dave ended up fading at the end, and we yeah. didn't finish that race. But that was, you know, that was a big water race. And there's just yeah. certain races that you just remember. The, the fans what, were, we there's like, something. yeah, there was like 10,000 people in the pits, like huge stage, yeah. people going nuts. It, it was a, it was wild. And to race where we, we were at, to ship the boats all over there and then get them there and actually be out on, you know, and doing our thing. And it was hot. It was real hot. And then I remember one in Dave Scott's boat in Key West. We broke a prop shaft, cost us a championship. CMS, same thing, last race. In it to win it, all we had to do was finish. Broke a prop shaft, cost us a world championship. There's a couple that have slipped away that yeah. you think about. MSD box got us in uh, Key West in the J Jimmy John's boat on our last time there. Yeah. Yeah, yep, yep, just yep. a little, some little part or something. They'll take you out and you're done because Again, in Key West, you, yeah, you got to be on the that one steering hose come loose on us. And yeah, you know. yeah. Imagine just There's going a, through the list of stuff that's place, went wrong. You know, a lot of them, and thankfully they've, they've been all safe through it. You know. Yeah. What is, think how many times? Me and, Myra, dump, me and Myra dumped it in Orange Beach, chasing oh, Steve yeah. Curtis. Yeah, I told I said in the first the first uh, podcast that we did, the, I kind of said Johnny went to bat for me because I thought I'd never be able to drive a boat again. And he was you were telling Dave that I didn't do anything wrong. You just took me in there so hot and we caught a wave in the corner. And uh, because the, the supercasts were fast back then. I mean, I think we'd go well, in the 140s. Fresh engines, 7600. So they, they were quicker. And yeah, yeah, I remember telling Dave, I said, Dave. Mark did his job. We got to the buoy. He's supposed to turn. He's not supposed to not turn. I just yeah. ran him in there too hot, and we just launched one sideways, and it did us. Yeah. This episode has been brought to you by Performance Boat Center. 
with locations in Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri and South Florida to serve all your boating needs. That's what I told Ray. I said, it's one thing to wreck, but then it's another thing to be sitting there in the tunnel of a dude's boat and he's in the helicopter above you looking down at you. <laughs> the boat with the pieces floating in the water beside you. <laughs> That's a different feeling that you've never had. So yeah, I, they, John, I, I've, I've, I've spoken to boat running again after something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I told him the story about uh, after that race, the next race was uh, – uh, Corpus Christi and we broke a drive and I was like, man, I was never so happy to actually break because I was so scared because we started on the, in second place right beside CRC and I didn't even turn it. We th went through like 10 rooster tails before I finally turned the boat into that first, and that first turn there along the beach in Corpus Christi. I mean, like I'd never been more scared in a boat until right there. I got one more Ray for you. Say yeah. what you're going to say. Sure. Yes. Remember, please. We were in Lake Mead racing CRC in the unlimited boat of Dave Scott's, and we had uh, quick change drop boxes on the back of the engine so we could do quick gear changes in the water. And and uh, I go test the boat, and I go, Mark, this one gear box don't have any oil pressure. I said, jump up in the boat, make sure that thing's flowing oil through the tank. So he jumps in, opens the cap, and says, yeah, it's flowing oil through the tank, must have a bad sender. So we go, and I hold it wide open two miles and blow that thing to smithereens. Done. Go, Mark. A gearbox will make it two miles wide open without oil before it fails. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What happens? We just, thing was but, Yeah. So, so there's a scavenge section and a pump section, and I had the, the pressure section ran right back in the scavenge section, and it was basically recircling the oil in the tank, but the, 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 the actual <laughs> gearbox was not doing anything. So, yeah. so thank, God, thank God we had a spare. That was another all-nighter. Yeah. Rocks and Lake Mead till about four in the morning trying to get that thing. Yeah, and and won the man. Next yeah, we won. We won. Battle but... Fast race, hundred eight mile an hour race. Yeah, and we got it with like two laps to go. We yeah, CRC was so fast back then. They had that forty two with them twelve hundred Merc racing engines in them. That yeah. thing was fast. But anyways, Ray, can I cut you. Yeah, off? my my question is, I've spoken to quite a few of your your racing partners over the years that have shared the car cockpit with you. And they've all said that you're, you're very uh, focused, very calm, despite what's going on. What, what is the secret to doing that and staying so calm and focused? I, I just, I don't see an advantage of, and I see here in recordings of other people in cockpits and things like that. And Myra can attest to that. If you got to be doing that much yelling and screaming and carrying <laughs> on and then, you're not, I don't think you're focusing on what you need to do. I just don't think there's any need for that. I know my driver's doing what they need to do, and I'm doing what I need to do. And 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 that also comes with time. I mean, I'm sure, sure. the first time me and Taylor were in the boat or the first time me and Myrick were in the boat or the first time me and, you know, a new new driver in the boat, yeah, you're talking a lot more of that race than you are. Yeah, a lot more, co lot more coaching and saying, hey, yeah. why don't you do this? And Yeah, but no, I've always been, re you know, I'm, I'm comfortable always been yeah. comfortable in the boats and it's always felt natural to me and uh i've you know i don't get tired in these boats and i i think when you get all worked up ten up <laughs> two laps in the race you're spent yeah you know and i i like to get out of these boats thinking you know usually the first couple of rap, laps seem like long then you get into a flow and then before you know it the race is over and you get out of the boat and it's like well, i could have done that all over again you know what i mean and i've just always Felt, you know, calm, focused, let my driver do their job, I do my job, and we communicate at times when we need to communicate. But there's no reason to, to get all animated and jacked sure. up, and that's not going to get you around the course any faster. Yeah. Well, that being said, do you have a method to and breaking in? Way, and my driver's not going to be calm. If I'm yeah. calm, my driver's calm. Do you have a method of breaking in a, a, a new racer, a new partner? No. Because, because you've had so many? I just, you know, usually, I mean, I've never had anyone that's never driven a boat. All Someone's always had <laughs> driving experience. I think what happens is what they haven't had is close quarters, side-by-side -side racing when it's bumpy, when you're going into a turn, when you got to trust the other guy and things like that. So those are things yeah. I'm trying to talk somebody through and pick a line for them or let them know how we're going to go about something. But usually anybody who has drive – you know, has been in a boat before. So, uh, and everybody's different. You know, some people, 
no problem. You know, come out of a race car, jump in a boat, no problem. And others I've had, uh, you know, and Forrest Barber would admit it, you know, took him some time, took him some time to get comfortable in the boat and get used to it. And you just, you know, you gauge what you have and you, and I just, whoever's with me, I give them all my attention and help them the best I can to get them comfortable, to get them comfortable. Cause when I get them comfortable, when they're comfortable, they get confident. And when they're confident, they get better. And yeah. then when they get better, we get faster. Exactly. And everybody's different. Everybody has a different learning curve. Everybody has a different feel for it. And one of the things I said to Taylor at the end of last year, I said, look, we've done approximately 20 boat races together. Think about where you are now. Think about where you are the first couple of races two years ago. You know, and it's a whole different yeah. thing. So, and everybody learns differently. So just uh, approach it as needed. The main thing well, is keep it comfortable. Going back to that, in Key West, you ran with Carlos in the Husky boat for the first time, mm -hmm. and you first guys time. secured the world championship. Yeah. What did you had, have to tell him? We did two full days of testing prior to it up at Gary Stray's shop up there in Stewart, Florida. So we had time in the boat, which was good. So I knew what to expect when we got down to Key West, but he's got a ton of race car experience. I mean, he was on a team that won a 24 hours a day Tony years ago. So Wow. He's got the driving ability, so it was a total, it was it was completely natural for him, and uh, actually it was it was quite easy. It wasn't like I was getting in the boat with a rookie driver at all. Sure, you know. Well, I mean, it, it was between the two Husky teams, you and Steve Curtis, you know, campaigning on on different boats for the same team. I mean, it's arguably the the best throttleman in the game, right, Myrick? Yeah. I mean, Myrick is 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 Team Pomelson saying. He, he said in the first podcast that you are the goat. So, and then <laughs> Curtis take Yeah, <laughs> buddy. Good yeah. guys out there. And Myrick's one of them. Yeah. And, um, and, and Curtis took the first race on uh, mm -hmm. Friday, and then you took the championship on Sunday. What, yeah, what's that yeah. like uh, competing with, with so Curtis? Steve's and both of you guys have been in. For yeah, both Steve was running, was actually a little bit shorter, about two feet shorter, had a little bit wider tunnel. Our boat was a little bit longer maybe two inch narrower tunnel and about a thousand pounds heavier. So Steve was quicker. <laughs> he was quicker all weekend. Um, on Sunday's race, we made a prop change that we should have done the previous race. So we accelerated better. We got across the back better. We got across the bumps better. The boat was much quicker. Didn't have the top end, but it was much quicker. So, and I'm not so sure I would have beat Steve on Sunday, but he got the jump on us at the start like I knew he would because all the data showed us that that boat was a quicker accelerating boat than ours and understandably being the difference in them. And plus Steve's got, he's got more hours in those boats than probably anybody I can think of, you know, been racing them for so long. Um, and so he knows that boat well. So they scored it out in front of us at the start, had a couple of boat links on us. So I knew we would be there. I expected, I thought we would hopefully run one, two down there. Well, what happened in that second race is when Nigel Hook came across the field from the inside, going to the wrong buoy and coming across to get to the buoy, Steve had to push out. So when Steve had to push out, I just dove underneath. And when I dove underneath, we were able to come out on the back straightaway, a boat or two in front of Steve, because he had the long way around the corner. <laughs> and then when you're evenly matched, passing somebody's, you know, you got to be significantly quicker to get around them. So we were able to hold him off for about four laps. And he was right there about three seconds behind. But then after about four or five laps, I noticed he started fading. And then, you know, they had a little grim engine gremlin that one engine was dropping three, 400 RPM. And that's when we were able to get 10 seconds, 12 seconds, 15 seconds. But the first three, four laps, you know, that race could have gone either way. It's just we were able to get underneath them in that first turn. And if, and if Nigel didn't come over like that where he didn't have to move over, I'm not so sure I would have got around him or not. I think we would have been right there, but getting around him, I don't know, would have been tough. And since we got there, if he would have stayed running, him getting around us would have been tough. You know? Yeah. So it was a close deal, but the start really kind of messed him up there. This podcast is powered by Speedboat Magazine. Subscribe now at speedboat.com for nine power-packed current issues a year direct to your mailbox.